Welcome to Switch, the 7 o'clock news brought to you most any hour by your city life. A year-end wrap-up of the news would not be complete without some discussion of the unprecedented drought we have suffered this year. The magnitude of this situation is pointed up by a report from our Tukwila Hydro Facility. This report is narrated by Gary Farr, our real property agent, not a plastic substitute. You are now looking at a 40-acre site just south of South Center, which is commonly referred to in the Tukwila area as the Duck Pond. The Duck Pond is owned by City Life, and we like to refer to it as a piece of property that has been flooded by the City of Tukwila. The property was originally purchased as a major substation site in the days of the expansion and at that time, we were competing with Puget Sound Tower and Light for this area. After the war with Puget Sound Tower and Light was declared over, it, the property that you're looking at was declared surplus. A portion of the property had been filled, but as you can see, the portion that was not filled is now inundated with water. This was partially caused because of the roadway construction in South Andover Park West that was constructed, which is also flooded, as you can see in the pictures. And the flooding condition that existed on this day, December 7th, was caused because the Green River was at an elevation of about 22 feet, while our property was at the elevation of uh, the water that you see on the property was at an elevation of about 19 and a half feet. Obviously, water seeks the lowest place. We have owned the property for several years and have been trying to sell the property for the several years, and we are uh, waiting anxiously to hear from any of you that uh, happen to want to buy a small recreation area. Uh, we're asking a mere $2.5 million with 16% down and 10 easy payments at 9 or 8.5% interest. Anybody interested, please contact property management. The next segment of the program will be of particular interest to our 325 female employees. International Women's Year was proclaimed by the United Nations in 1975. For the United States, the National Conference was held in Houston, Texas in November of this year. It was attended by several city employees and engendered considerable controversy. For an on-the-spot report, here's our roving reporter, Nancy Callery. I went to Houston with great expectations of the first National Women's Conference mandated by Congress. I came away physically exhausted, but mentally charged up by a powerful national battery of women. As a non-delegate with press credentials, I found that there were many diverse events occurring simultaneously. In the Houston Coliseum, delegates elected from state conferences accomplished the tremendous job of passing 26 resolutions, which are recommendations for the President and Congress on the status of women in the United States. Strict parliamentary procedure was followed here, and the mood resembled a national political convention such as the Republican or Democratic conventions. Meanwhile, hundreds of booths, sponsored by state coordinating committees and different organizations, were set up in the Albert Thomas Convention Center and Exhibition Hall. I spent hours browsing these exhibits, picking up information, talking with women and men from all over the world, and admiring the decorations everyone brought with them. For instance, the Washington State booth featured a beautiful quilted banner depicting the Northwest scenic landscape. Many of these exhibits were collected by the Smithsonian Institute for Future Generations. At the same time, a full schedule of outstanding lectures, performances, skills workshops, and meetings were conducted for anyone to attend. At these events and everywhere else, I was constantly seeing, hearing, and rubbing shoulders with celebrities I never thought I'd have an opportunity to meet. 
in an atmosphere of excitement and friendship. Due to the national eminence of the Seattle Medic One facility and the attendant publicity, most people are aware of CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This technique is particularly effective in cases of electrical shock and hence is of particular interest to our electrical workers. One aspect of the CPR technique, which may not have been considered by many, is how do you get the patient into a position to administer the life-saving procedure. Linemen have developed and regularly practice a method of getting a victim of shock from the top of a pole to the ground. Each year at the Governor's Safety Council, an inter-utility contest is held involving two-man teams from various utilities throughout the state to demonstrate and promote interest in this pole top rescue procedure. Following our scene from this year's contest, narrated by one of City Lights team members, Bill Roberts. I'd like to tell you something about pole top rescue. I realize probably a lot of people really don't know what pole top rescue is all about, but in our particular business, it's really a good thing to know about uh, getting a man off a pole when he's in trouble. Uh, City Light has a real good program for pole top rescue. All of the crews, every six months, practice it. We have the um, mannequin and we have the resuscitating Annie and everyone practices CPR and rigging the mannequin and getting him off the pole. Uh, City Light this year was picked as one of the teams to go down to the Governor's Safety Conference. And uh, Dick Koontz and I were the two gentlemen that went down this year. We practiced up a bit for, for the conference this year. We practiced up about a week. And uh, we went down to the conference with some high hopes. But uh, in uh, rigging the mannequin on the pole, I got a little excited. And I uh, took the hand line and I rigged them around the mannequin and also wrapped it around the top secondary. So when we tried to pick the mannequin up, it was a little hard to pick the, everything up. So when I finally realized what I'd done, I just decided to re-rig the mannequin and we finally got him to the ground, but with an awfully long time that it took us, uh, it kind of shot us down in the conference. Uh, Pacific Power and Light were the ones that took first place, and City Light, of course, took fourth, which isn't too bad. Uh, the competition to me was really good. I enjoyed it a lot, and if I had the chance, I'd do it again. As my faithful listener knows, a regular feature of this program is an interview with one of our employees. Selected to be under the gun this time is Mr. Ken Gorahoff, our employee relations manager since November of this year. Here's Ken being put on the spot by our star reporter, Nancy Callery. She also would interview a star. Uh, well, I came from the Human Rights Commission, and I worked there eight years. Prior to that, I worked at Boeing uh, for almost five years in uh, personnel management. How did you get this job? I um, took an open competitive exam, which was a written exam, lasted six hours or something like that, and uh, I scored in the top ten. And then uh, there was an outside board of a university professor and somebody from the Department of Labor that uh, interviewed the top ten people and uh, apparently I came out number one and so the job was offered to me and I took it. I felt it was a very interesting and challenging job to accept. Well, besides your professional um, credentials, what are what other things are you interested in? What do you do in your spare time? Oh, well, I... Um, I'm into skiing in a big way. I work as a ski instructor uh, during the winter months, and uh, I play, play tennis during the summer months quite a bit, and uh, I like to go fishing and hiking and climbing in the mountains. How do you view the new, your new job in employee relations? Employee relations is 
kind of an interesting and challenging thing to get into because employee relations has to represent uh, a management position, but at the same time they have to represent uh, uh, the employee. And uh, um, what I would like to do or what I uh, would like to see is that uh, credibility be built up in the employee relations unit uh, so that uh, people can, if they have problems uh, or if they're being treated unfairly, that employee relations can take some sort of action. And could you explain to those who are not familiar with the new organization what employee relations comprises? Yeah, employee relations comprises personnel services, which is um, employee uh, interviewing new hires, uh, employee records, uh, uh, transfers, uh, all of that paperwork that goes on if uh, uh, there's uh, any uh, type of movement of employees. Uh, also safety and uh, also training. So far, how do you like the new job? It's very interesting. It's very challenging. Uh, the people around have been most helpful. Uh, I, I was really amazed that uh, uh, when I came here, it's probably the first new job that I've ever had where everybody uh, wanted to help, show me around, and uh, it's made it a lot easier for me. I, I really like it so far. That's about it for now. For Switch, your City Light News, this is your anchor man, Ted Baxt, uh, Miles Chamberlain, saying Arrivederci, which is Italian for you were expecting maybe Eric Severide?